Welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast, brought to you by TournamentPokerEdge.com, the only podcast dedicated exclusively to poker tournament strategy. Now here's your host, Clayton Fletcher. Hello once again, everybody, and welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast. I'm your host, Clayton Fletcher, in New York City, where today, as I'm recording this on April 1st, 2021, April Fool's Day, I was fooled for a few seconds anyway by an article published by PokerNews.com about how Chris Moneymaker's actual last name is not Moneymaker. It fooled me. I don't know if anyone else saw that one, but I thought that was pretty good. There were a few seconds before I realized what day it is. And uh, yeah, I thought that was pretty good, especially when he has been in the news already in the last week or two about his recent sponsorship deal with America's Card Room. So he was already kind of front of mind because he has been in the news lately. So then uh, seeing that, (laughs) that somehow... That fooled me for a few seconds. I'm wondering if it got anyone else as well. The other big news today, which I'm hoping and praying is not actually an April Fool's prank of any kind, is that the uh, World Series of Poker will take place this year in the fall. It looks like it's starting at the end of September and ending with the main event in early November. So it'll be kind of like the old days when we had a November 9, except there will not be a three-month study period between making the final table and playing the November 9. So I'm very happy that we're at least going to have the most important series of the year. It won't be in the usual months, uh, the summer months. Uh, I'm rare, okay? I know that I'm rare. I will never complain about how hot it is in Vegas in the summer. I actually like the heat. I know that might sound crazy to many of you listening to this because you don't like to be where it's 117 degrees, but I'll be honest, it really doesn't bother me. I like going outside in the summer. I like being in the blazing sun in the middle of the desert. I'm a very strange person in many ways, and that's only one of them. The other big news this week that uh, I wanted to share is that Stand-up comedy is now legal again in New York City. So since the start of the pandemic, I believe the last date that we were allowed to perform was actually March 15th of 2000. So we're finally open again for business starting tomorrow, April 2nd. And I will be performing at Greenwich Village Comedy Club on the day this podcast is released, February 2nd. I will be doing two shows One starts at 7.30 and the other one starts at 9.30. So if anyone's in New York, uh, come on out. Greenwich Village Comedy Club on McDougal Street. And help me uh, feel confident (laughs) since it's been so long since I've actually uh, been doing stand-up in New York City. So anyway, back to the World Series of Poker. I wanted to say I'm excited. They haven't, of course, released all the details of the schedule yet, but it will be a full slate It's something like six or seven weeks with further details to be announced later. So it's all exciting. Uh, Another thing that's going on, baseball is in full swing. I'm very, very excited for that. Uh, I do have a bet (laughs) with Jeff Platt this time around. Uh, I don't know. David Tuckman didn't respond to (laughs) to my request for action. So I guess he won enough of my money the last time I took the Orioles over. So uh, I have, a, I have a, uh, a wager with my friend and Poker Go superstar announcer, Jeff Platt. And we've got a substantial wager, let's just say, on the outcome of the Orioles season. And the number of games the Orioles need to beat is 64. So it is possible this, this one could tie if they win exactly 64 but if it's under that, uh, then Platt gets my money, 
And if it's over that, then I win. So I can't help myself. You know, my team is so bad and they've been so bad for so long. The only way for me to make it interesting is to make possibly ill-advised bets on their season win total so that every game matters more to me than it does to anyone else who might be watching. Anyway, uh, that's what's going on. I wanted to share with you guys a few hands that I played recently in New Jersey. And I want to give you a warning right now that if you are not fans of hands in which you don't always know what everyone has, uh, this will not be a fun podcast for you to listen to uh, because at least one of the hands that I'm about to share uh, doesn't actually make it to showdown. So uh, I wanted to give you guys a warning because I know for some people that's very frustrating. They want to know what the results are. They'll wonder for the rest of their lives what the other player had. So I will definitely tell you what I had in the hands that I played, uh, and that's for sure. So before we get to that, I want to thank you guys for your commentary and for taking uh, heed of my pleas for you to leave a favorable review for us on Apple Podcasts. You guys have no idea how much that helps. It really does change how soon we pop up if somebody types in poker in the uh, search bar on Apple Podcasts. So, uh, And also, if we get enough good reviews, we can actually become what they call featured on there. So, I mean, this is all kind of like podcasty silliness, but uh, just know that if you want to uh, give us a shout out we really appreciate it if you could uh, do that on Apple Podcasts. Just give us a five-star review and say anything, really, about the podcast that you like. And, and it means a lot. So thanks for doing that. Thanks also for your comments about last week's episode with Killing Bird. I know you guys. I know you want him on more often. We all do. He is extremely lovable. Um, he knows a lot about poker. And he's Mr. TPE. So... What's not to love? Uh, he's just not always available. I would love. I invite him every week when I'm planning to record. I say, could you record on this day or that day at this time or that time? And whenever he can do it, he he does. But you know, as you guys know, when this podcast was was really going strong years ago, our beloved Derek was a lot less busy than he is now. So you've seen in, in recent years before I took over hosting the podcast exactly how available he is. And he really only has time to do a podcast here and there. So when he can't make it, I try to get other guests. And many times, as you just see how it works out, you guys are often stuck with me. And I hope that's okay. I love doing this job so much and I have no intention of stopping anytime soon. Thank you also for those of you who have been active on Twitter, at Clayton Comic, uh, sending me messages about recent hands or about recent episodes, and I'm sorry that I haven't been able to respond to all of them, but please know that sooner or later I do read all of the messages. Uh, I always start with the ones that are actually public messages where you just at me on Twitter and then I go to my DMs, and the simple reason for that is responding to a public message is also a way that we can promote the podcast. And so that is the preferred method. But I do answer my uh, private messages as well. And one of my favorite things of all about doing this job is the interaction I get to have with what we affectionately call TPE Nation. So if you're not on board yet, join Twitter at Clayton Comic and we'll have some fun. All right, now let's get to these hands, all right? Now these are all going to be coming from, I have three hands for you today, by the way, so it's gonna be a little bit heavy on the strategy, and you'll see why in just a few minutes. Now these are from the $320 WSOP.com Silver Legacy Circuit event. So there's a lot at stake in these events. Um, you get an official WSOP circuit ring if you win one. You also get an entry into the circuit free roll, which is for everyone who makes the top 100 of the of that particular series leaderboard. So uh, there's more than just the prizes, but the prize for this one was pretty substantial for first place anyway. I think it was in the neighborhood of forty or fifty thousand dollars. So it's what they call a double stack. Now a lot of the tournaments on this site. 
they start you with 10,000 chips and this one starts with 20,000 chips. And this first hand I want to share is from very early on. Uh, the very first level of the tournament blinds are 20, 40, no ante yet. And our table is sitting seven handed. Now it's early and we all have about 20,000. No real blood has been drawn yet. And a kind of a loose-ish uh, recreational player that I recognize from other tournaments Min raises under the gun to 80 and it folds to us in the cutoff with the ace deuce of spades. So ace of spades, deuce of spades. Now, obviously, it's fine to call here with your ace deuce suited. Um, you really don't want to get four bet. So if you three bet and you get four bet, then you will often be folding a hand that has a lot of equity. Uh, so if your default play is to just call in this spot, especially being so deep, that's fine with me. I think mixing in a three bet from the cutoff or the button every so often is also a good play. I'm not particularly worried about a light four bet, but I want to be extra certain to discourage a light four bet by making a substantial three bet. It's much harder to play back against a larger re-raise. So we go ahead and make it 380. Remember he opened to 80 and now we've added another 300 on top of that for a total of 380 and it folds all the way back around to the under the gun original razor who just calls. So now we'll be in position holding the suited ace deuce and there's 820 in the pot. We've got like almost 20,000 behind. So we're playing deep stack poker here. And this is a good spot to be in. I mean, even before the flop comes down, it's unlikely our opponent has a premium pocket pair. Some players would just flat with jacks in villains' shoes, but it's unlikely that he's got queens, kings, aces, or ace, king. Most players would include those hands in their four betting ranges. And I think that this opponent is no exception. Remember, he is an amateur, recreational, loosish player. And he has raised under the gun, which actually gives my three bet a little bit more clout. It's a little bit less likely that I have like a suited wheel ace kind of hand like I have because he raised under the gun. So... All things being equal, I would normally not be three betting with this type of hand versus a under the gun open when I'm in the cutoff. But because of the notes I had taken on this opponent, I realized that his under the gun range isn't as tight as most players. So therefore, he could easily have something like a king jack off suit here. And then I will usually take it down with my big three bet, which is a perfectly fine result. So instead, he does call, and we see a flop. And with 820 in the pot, it comes 10 of diamonds, 9 of spades, 6 of hearts. And he checks. Again, hero holding the ace, deuce of spades. So we have an overcard, a backdoor flush draw, and not much else. I decide to go ahead and see bet here. I bet half the pot, 410 into 820, and my opponent called. Now, you can give up here if you want. I could have just checked behind, planning to fold when, if and when our opponent bets on the turn. But one of the reasons I bet is that I don't expect my opponent to have hit this flop very much. Uh, yeah, he could have something like Jack-10 in his range, but a lot of his range is going to be like your king-queen type of hands, possibly better aces than what we have, ace-queen, ace-jack, possibly pocket pairs like eights, king-jack, and so on. So given that we're up against that range, and given the fact that my pre-flop action shows so much strength, I decided to go ahead and continuation bet here, but it's not automatic. And it's fine with me if you if you want to play it a, a different way. So uh, I do bet 410 and our opponent calls. So And now notice that when I only bet half the pot on the flop, I'm giving myself the opportunity 
if it just works one time out of three, we break even. And if it works more often than that, then we're doing even better. So I decided to give it a shot. And the plan is basically, if he does call, we're going to fire again when we pick up equity on the turn. Uh, so now with 1640 in the pot, the turn is the 10 of hearts. Pairing the board, so now we have 10, 9, 6, 10 with two hearts. And our opponent checks again. Now, I did just say a second ago that my thought process at the time was to pretty much do another barrel if and only if we pick up equity on the turn. Now, this card does not improve our equity, but I thought it would just be a great card to represent strength. It is unlikely our opponent has a 10. And also, when the board pairs, most of your opponents will be expecting you to shut down your bluffs. So all I've done is shown pure aggression, pure strength throughout this hand. And now the top card pairing doesn't slow me down. I think it becomes very hard for our opponent to hang on with a hand like pocket sevens, pocket eights, even though those hands have gut shots. And certainly we can fold out hands like ace, queen, king, queen, king, jack, even though some of them have a gut shot. If I put out a big bet here, especially with the paired board, most opponents will just give up and live to fight another day. So he checks, and into 1640, I decide to fire again, this time 1230, which is about three quarters of the pot, and our opponent folds. Now, one reason why this strategy works more than you might think is because early in the tournament, a lot of players have a mindset of there's no reason to play a big pot right now. There's no reason to get into a huge confrontation in level one. This tournament's a marathon. This thing takes like nine hours, 10 hours to complete. It's just getting started. You know, maybe he won a satellite. He doesn't want to lose half his stack on the first hand of a what's considered a, a higher stakes tournament. A $300 buy-in online is still considered pretty high. So... For all those reasons, and because of my familiarity with this particular opponent, I decided to go full Clayton and just keep betting until he folded, and he did so on the turn. So that was a good start for us. We got off to a, a fine start in this tournament, and then things continued swimmingly for about an hour, hour and a half, and the next hand happens at the 150 300 level. There's also a 30 chip ante per player. At this point in the tournament, the average stack was up to about 24,000 and we had 32,000. So we're just doing great, about 33% higher than the average stack. We have been playing a pretty aggressive style. A lot of the things that we've been doing have been working. I think that my table image is that I'm tough, I'm aggressive, and I'm just kind of generally a uh, pain in the butt. I think the players on my right are especially unhappy with their seating assignments. So that's the kind of image you want to have. This gives you a, hey, don't mess with me kind of vibe, which is all well and good. We are second in ships at our table. And on this hand, the action folds to the button, who is a loose, aggressive type. I think that he's going to be opening something like 75, maybe 80% of the time when it's folded to him. He makes it 750 at 150, 300, so 2.5x. And this player has about 18,000 behind. Uh, we're in the big blind. So the small blind folds and we're in the big blind. We wake up with pocket sevens, seven of hearts, seven of diamonds, and it is absolutely fine to just call here. I think that the standard play may even be to just call and see a flop. You're going to be out of position, but sometimes you'll hit a set or otherwise favorable flop. Uh, maybe you can call a little bit light if there's only one card higher than yours on the flop. There is a strategy that supports playing a relatively small pot. Now, I like to three bet here. And the reason why 
is that I think that our opponent is opening way too many hands on his button, and I fully expect to take it down a lot. Obviously, we only get a tough decision when we get four bet. Uh, That's when things get tough because our opponent only has 18,000 chips. So if we three bet and get four bet, then we're actually right around the pot commitment threshold of something like six or 7,000. And then it's very hard to figure out what to do with a medium pair like sevens. So we're fading the possibility that we're going to be put into that awkward situation. By the way, I think I would probably fold unless it were a very small four bet. But yeah, if he makes it like six or seven K with 18 K behind, I think it's correct to just get away from my sevens because his four betting range should mostly be very strong hands, uh, big pairs plus ace king. I think a lot of players would just flat this three bet with ace queen. And again, we want to make it kind of big here. You don't want to just click it or do a small three bet. He made it 750. We three bet to 2,760. So it costs our opponent 2,010 to call. So it's not a trivial call for him, especially when he only starts with 18K. And it also makes it that much more difficult for villain to four bet light. So the bigger three bet here kind of keeps his actions a little bit more sincere and pure, which I love. So he does call somewhat to my surprise because I do expect this three bet to take it down a lot. And now we get to see a flop with pocket sevens. The pot is about 6K. Villain has about 15K behind. And the flop comes nine of clubs, Six of spades, tray of hearts. Would you bet this flop or check it? I think once we take the lead, three betting pre-flop, and this is basically a good flop for our hand, hot and cold. I mean, we probably had the best hand pre-flop. We probably still have the best hand now, and there aren't that many draws available that would have called the three bet pre-flop. Yeah, he could have 5-4, or 8-7, but I really doubt that he would put in 20% of his stack before the flop with hands like that. And if he did, he's a worse player than I thought he was, certainly. So I'm not too worried about him drawing, although he could be drawing to live over cards. So I went ahead and made the C-bet on the flop basically to protect my hand from those over card type hands Ace, queen, king, queen suited, and others that may have decided to call in position against a fairly aggressive player, that being myself. So I want to try to get those hands to fold. I don't think that this bet can get many better hands to fold. Like if he's got a pair of nines or better, uh, I, I don't think that this bet will ever get those hands to fold. But I'm trying to clean up some of the equity and just protect our hand from possible overcards. So this is a classic old school, not wanting to give my opponent a free card to beat me continuation bet. So 3000 into 6,000 and fill in calls. So the turn is the eight of clubs. So our board is now nine, eight, six, tray. So the question is, should we fire again? We did pick up the open-ended straight draw, and there's still a reasonable chance that our pair of sevens is good. Anyhow, he could have hands like ace six suited, ace tray suited, possibly in his range, although I would probably have folded those hands to the big three bet in his shoes. I'm not sure how he would respond with those particular hands. So he could have a pair like that and is putting us on ace-king or maybe not putting us on ace-king, but just praying that that's what we have and hoping that we do not fire again on the turn. So with our pair of sevens and our 
open-ended straight draw, we look and we see that our opponent only has a pot-sized bet left in his stack. There's about 12K in the pot and about the same behind for our opponent. So we could just shove here and now possibly convince him to fold a better hand. Something like pocket tens may at least occasionally go away when faced with this kind of action. We are clearly representing a bigger hand than the one we have when we shove. But in my experience, generally, people don't fold over pairs no matter how much you bet. For that reason, I think that this is a spot where despite having picked up so much equity with this eight of clubs, giving us an open ender to go along with our pair, I think that betting here is a mistake and that we should check. And if our opponent goes all in with his pot size bet remaining, we I think we actually need to fold because even with 10 outs, we're not getting the right price with only one card to come. So that would be very sad to have to fold the pair of sevens with the open ender. But I think that's probably the play. So more likely we would check and he would make some other bet or check behind. And then we can figure out how to play the river. Instead, what happens here is that I made a mistake and I bet. I'm glad I didn't go all in. I think it actually looks stronger what I did. I bet 9,000 into 12,000. Now at that point, if he shoves, of course we have to call for 3,000 more now that the pot would be huge. But it's just too high variance and a mistake to make this play. So I'm not really a fan of my play here, but I am happy to report it worked. Our opponent folded, so I think that this 9,000 on the turn was a mistake and that checking is the play, but uh, this is one of those times when I made a bad play and got lucky because my opponent did fold. My best guess is that he still had the two over cards type of hand. If I really had to try to put him on one exact hand, I would say ace-queen because ace-queen should sometimes call on the flop and see what happens on the turn. Okay, so last hand. This one, you know, this tournament was just going so well. Swimmingly, as I said before. In the next level, the blinds go up to 200-400 with a 50 ante. And we have 37,000-ish when the average is right around 25. So we're doing great, about 50% above the average stack. And still second at our table, by the way. There is one slightly larger stack to our right. In this hand, it's folded to us in the hijack. We are now nine-handed. We have the nine of diamonds, eight of diamonds. So, you know, our M right now is about 36. We've got 92 big blinds, if you prefer. So we are deep stacked. Also, there are a lot of other well-heeled opponents. Uh, the blinds, for example, have... 30K for the small blind and 28K for the big blind. So they both have nice size stacks. Uh, the only a shorty in quotation marks at this whole table has 18K. So we're, we're all pretty deep here. So if it folds to us in the hijack and we've got a suited 9-8, throwing it away is absolutely viable. You know, you don't have to play every suited connector you're ever dealt you can wait until you're in the cutoff or the on the button if you want to. I, I don't really have a problem with people having a very tight pre-flop strategy, especially when they're deep stacked and doing fine in a tournament. You know, opening this hand, you can get into some awkward spots. I like to raise it because I'm doing well in the tournament. I have a good sense of how my opponents play I'm not surrounded by crushers, although there are a lot of crushers in this event. This was a Saturday evening tournament, and you will get a good number of crushers like Ryan LaPlante, Tony Dunst, kind of the usual WSOP.com regs uh, in this event and events like it, especially because everyone is hungry for the jewelry and, of course, entry into the free roll and the national championship and whatever else comes with winning circuit events so you will absolutely encounter some crushers in tournaments like this one but i happen to be 
at a pretty good table. So for me, I think it's an open, but if you told me, you know, Clayton, I would rather wait until I have a hand like this on the button or the cutoff, that is also totally fine. But when I feel like I'm in control of my table, I like to go ahead and play more pots. I do open bigger because taking it down is totally fine. And because we're so big and because there are no stacks to my left that can really shove and make any sense, I'm happy to open it a little bigger. So I made it 11, 12, which I don't know what that is. It's just under 3x. So I make it 1,112. And it does fold all the way to the big blind who calls. Now, let's talk about this guy. I've played with him not only on this site, but also on Party Poker, New Jersey. So I'm very familiar with his playing style. He does some weird things. Probably a slightly profitable reg would be my guess. Like, he's not a bad player. He just does some things that uh, would sometimes be either ill-advised at worst, or at best, they just don't make any sense to me. So I have notes on him. FPS is something that I wrote in the notes section on this opponent. And to me, that stands for fancy play syndrome. So he likes to be tricky sometimes for the sake of being tricky. So he knows the moves and he kind of likes to do them all, even when he'd actually do better by taking a more straightforward route. So I hope that gives you kind of a picture of what type of opponent we have we see a flop heads up again. Hero holding the 9-8 of diamonds. And with 2,900 in the pot, the flop comes king of diamonds, six of hearts, five of clubs. So king, six, five. We have a backdoor flush draw and a gut shot. He checks, as he probably will about 100% of the time in this situation. And I go ahead and fire a little bigger than you might expect. I really have a strong interest in taking it down right now. So, and I'd also like to be able to make a bigger bet once in a while to protect my hand when I have something like king, queen, or pocket aces. I might want to make a bigger bet once in a while. So I think that a lot of us right now are in sort of a... I guess an auto autopilot mode where when we see bet, we like to bet like a third of the pot or many players I see nowadays even less than that. I think once in a while putting in a bigger bet and just maybe getting a few more folds is well worth it. I'm not planning to fire another shell on this one unless I pick up substantial equity or hit a gin seven to make a, a the nut straight on the turn. So normally I think you might bet maybe a little less than a thousand into 2,900, but I went ahead and bet 2,155. And part of it has to do with my read on my opponent. He is a fancy play kind of guy. So I don't want to just get check raised too much. So I bet 2,155 and our opponent does raise even this big bet, a little over two-thirds of the pot, he check-raised to 5110, which is really just a little tiny bit bigger than a min-raise. So I'm getting a pretty sweet price to draw. And he's got 22 k behind, so the implied odds are basically there, considering I have a backdoor flush draw as well as a gut shot and we don't really know what this raise means, I decided to call. If you told me that the fact that he check raised at all is enough to get you to fold this hand, I'm actually okay with that. But for me, I'd rather give action and see what happens. I like to play in position. He gave me a very good price. There was already about 10000 in the pot when he raised it to 5110 so I was getting 3 to 1 expressed odds. And then with his big stack behind, we also have the implied odds. So I'm actually hoping he has something good and that we can get lucky enough to hit that 7. And I think we have 
just enough chips to speculate. So I do make the call. And now with 13,000 in the middle and our opponent with 22,000 more behind, the turn card comes the ace of spades. So our board is now king, six, five, ace. And our opponent checks. Now it is very uncommon for a player to check raise and then shut down unless that player does not like the turn card. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, you will see you know, the crushers will do this sometimes with the set, hoping that somehow I will have either hit that ace or choose to represent it so that they can get in another check raise. But, you know, given that he's only got 22,000 more, if he has value here, something like a set of fives, right? He needs to keep betting to make sure that he gets all of that money in by the end of the hand. So you've got to go for the double up. And he really does hope that I have an ace when he has that hand. So his check made me suspicious. And I started to think that perhaps his flop check raise was not value and that he himself could have a hand like a pair of sixes possibly 7-4, uh, 4 tray, one of the available straight draws, or perhaps nothing at all. When I combine the tiny sizing on the flop with the check on the turn with the information I already have about this FPS opponent, I'm starting to think that this pot is available. However, I want more information and I decide to check behind. Now the plan on this river card is that if our opponent checks again, the check raise flop, check turn, check river from out of position is such a rare and unusual line that I would pretty much have to take a stab. So let's see. The river comes the queen of hearts for a final board of king, six, five, ace, queen. And our opponent has now checked twice after having made a small, very small check raise on the flop. So with 13,000 in the middle, I decide to go ahead and bluff. And the reasons are everything I just said, plus the fact that I know I can't win this pot with nine high. Although now if I think about it, there are a few hands we can beat like seven, four and four tray and the more rare eight, seven. And I say that only because I have an eight myself. I think that our opponent has taken his shot with a fancy play on the flop and has now decided to give up. So we bet 8,200 into 13,000 and opponent folds. So I did warn you guys that I will be talking about some hands where we will never know what our opponent had. And it turns out there were three of them that I won in the early stages of the $320 buy-in Silver Legacy Circuit event on WSOP.com last Saturday. That'll do it for this episode. I want to thank you guys for listening as always. And please do take the time to give us a little love on Apple Podcasts or leave a review and a few kind words wherever you happen to download your listening materials so for everyone here at tournament poker edge i'm clayton fletcher thank you so much for listening
Love nobody. Everybody, everybody. 